Fu on YouTube. Um, and, and then um, I started sharing about Thanksgiving and how we had our family together and my brother, my youngest brother's house, and there were probably 70 of us because I've got six brothers, five of us, six of us were there, and all of our children and all of our children's children. So that was about 70 people. Anyway, I was saying how... Um, and I know probably on YouTube, y'all probably think, why is he talking about this? Well, because I was like, now you can know why we were all laughing and chuckling when you came on. Um, <laughs> and, and this is probably, I'm probably going to get in trouble later with my daughter for doing this on YouTube. But, um, but cause you know, you're supposed to be about the business. You're on YouTube, man. Just don't waste people's time. But it was really, it was really a blessing to have all of us together. And there's not so much as a single argument all day, right? It's such a blessing. Um, especially when we have such strong personalities in my family. And mine is moderately strong and that everybody here was laughing at me because they think something else or something. I don't know what the judgment call was, but there was obviously some judgment going on. Anyway, um, so just really thankful for the fact that I had an opportunity to get together with my family. I hope you had an opportunity to do the same and enjoy each other's company. Uh, last week, last Wednesday, we talked about the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it um, from Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. And we talked about the fact that the blessing, like riches are a blessing from the Lord. And, and I know some of you are probably wondering, well, Myron, if riches are a blessing from the Lord, how come so many evil people are rich? Well, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, right? So riches are a blessing from the Lord. But if you want to know the answer to that question, a couple things. You can go back and watch the video I did last week because I go into some of that. Like why, do, like why do people who are not God's people have wealth? Well, I went into that a little bit last week, but there's a video that I did a long time ago. It's, it's my most controversial, most consumed um, um, video, and it's called Why Evil People Are Rich. So if you want to, if, like, if you really want the answer to that question, if, if riches are a blessing from the Lord, why are so many evil people rich? I have a video called Why Evil People Are Rich. It's not why rich people are evil. It's why evil people are rich. By the way, they, both of those sentences have the same words, but they don't mean the same thing. The syntax, the syntax changes the meaning. Okay, so you are tracking. So last week we talked about the fact the blessing of the Lord maketh the rich, and we talked about the blessing of the purpose of riches. Today we're going to talk about the blessing of the power of riches. Okay, um, because like I, I think there are far too many people in the world who believe that riches are somehow this evil idea that Satan conjured up in his evil laboratory in his evil empire. But it's not. Um, so riches are a blessing from the Lord. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. By the way, he, there are people who don't understand that, but they don't understand it because they're, what we have to do is we have to come to this word of God, to the scripture, without a preconceived notion if we're going to learn what it says. We can't come thinking we know what it says. Even the stuff I think I know what it says, I know there's at least a possibility that I may have misinterpreted it. So I'm always going to allow myself, my beliefs, to be corrected by Scripture. Okay? And so, uh, like, sometimes people will say, they'll say, that as, as, an, as an argument to what I'm teaching, they'll say, well, um, um, I saw a comment recently. What was it? Um, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? Well, obviously, it won't profit him anything. But that's not an argument against what I'm teaching. It's just a different perspective of the same situation. Like, if I had to choose between riches and loving God with all my heart and loving people, I would choose loving God and loving people. But I don't have to choose, right? That's, that's the mistake people make. They make the mistake, well, you can either love God or you can be rich. Well, you can be rich and love God. I, we know this is a fact because Abraham loved God. And he believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness. And the first time the word rich is mentioned in the Bible is talking about Abraham. So anyway, today we're going to talk about um, the blessing of the power of riches, like the power to get wealth. So, and I'm, I know you already know the verse, but I'm going to read it to you um, in its context. Because God's getting, God took the children of Israel out of bondage in Egypt. <laughs> Excuse me, and he's getting ready to take them into the promised land, and he's giving them a warning. Deuteronomy, Deut, Deuce, two, Deuteronomy, second giving of the law. 
So God gave the children of Israel the law when they were in the wilderness, but he gave it to them again a second time right before they went into the promised land. And so what he's doing is he's telling them, when you go into this land that I'm going to give you, don't make the mistake of thinking that when everything's, well, I'm just going to read it to you. So Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 12, here's what it says. Let's, uh, and in fact, I'm going to start with verse number um, I'm going to start with verse number 10. When thou hast eaten and art full, then shalt thou bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied, and thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness, wherein uh, were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, uh, and there was no water, who brought forth water out of a rock of flint, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou shalt say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. So first of all, notice the power to get wealth is a gift from God. It is, he said, when you go into the promised land. So Romans chapter 14, I think it's verse 17, says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. So, the, so for every New Testament principle, there is an Old Testament illustration. Okay? And so when we're reading stories in the Old Testament, we are supposed to look for life lessons in those stories, not just read them as some kind of historical account of what happened. Right? And so <laughs> when you understand that in the New Testament, one of the things it teaches us is that sin is bondage. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt before we came to Christ and received him as our Savior, which, by the way, is not the same thing as giving your life to Jesus, okay? So I, want, I, I know I keep emphasizing that, but there are a lot of, there's this false doctrine going around that salvation is giving your life to Jesus. Salvation is not a gift we give Jesus. Salvation is a gift God gives us through Jesus. Right? So, so people say, well, I gave my life to Jesus. Well, and? He, wasn't, he didn't, what's he going to do with it? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to get a little attitude. Like, like his life is going to do you way more value than your life is going to do him. But the love of Christ constraineth me because I thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that we which live should not henceforth live unto ourselves, but unto him which died for them and rose for him, but unto him which died for us and rose again. So the reason I give my life to Christ is out of gratitude and love because he gave his life for me. I don't give my life to Christ for salvation, right? And some of you say, well, what difference does it make? Well, words matter. That's why we use them, right? So it, it, it makes a difference. Anyway, but the, so, so we were in bondage to sin before we came to Christ, right? Just like the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt before they, before they were brought through the Red Sea, right? Okay, so when we come to Christ, we are coming out of bondage. So there are all kinds of Old Testament pictures and stories and types that this is teaching us. Um, the children of Israel came out of bondage. We come out of the bondage of sin. Well, because the bondage of sin is not just external, but it's also internal, right? When we come out of the bondage, a lot of the bondage is still in us. And so our wilderness wandering is losing the bondage that is in us. It's like the more, like, G, like Jesus said to um, the Jews that believed on him in John, John chapter 8, he said, he said, if you continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed or in truth, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's the truth that makes people free. 
Well, if it's truth that makes people free and knowing the truth, then it's being bound by the errors and lies of the world system that put us in bondage. Everybody track and wave at me, my people. Wave at me. Okay, cool. So, so all of that to say this, God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, brought them through the wilderness into the promised land, and blessed them with multiplied herds and flocks and silver and gold and goodly houses, not just so they could live a great life. Look at me. I'm rich. I'm living a great life. But that he may establish his covenant as he swore before. See, see that when we read that, you know what? That just sounds like words to us. Can I get a witness? We're my people, right? But that's not just words. What is a covenant? A covenant is, an, is a promise that you make on your, a promise out of love that you make on your life. You are swearing on your life that you're gonna give everything you have, your time, your resources, your effort, your energy, uh, your knowledge, um, inconvenience, and even your very life if necessary to protect the person you're in covenant with or the people you're in covenant with. And if you don't do that, may what happened to the animal that you sacrificed in the covenant right, may that happen to you. So God, when he said, the reason I'm doing this is to establish my covenant. I, I want you to wrap, wrap your mind around this. <clears throat> God is telling the children of Israel, I'm bringing you into the promised land to establish the covenant that I made with your fathers. And, and if, if you want to see what that covenant looks like, go back and look at Genesis chapter 15. God put Abram to sleep. Two people in scripture, God put to sleep, right? Adam, when he took the rib out and gave him his wife, Right? That's called a what? That's called the covenant of marriage. The second time God put somebody to sleep, he put Abram to sleep, Genesis chapter 15. He put him to sleep, and then he puts him to sleep, and then he starts talking to him. Like, like, I'm not talking about like preachers do, right? They'll put you to sleep and keep preaching at you. I ain't talking about that, right? Come on, come on now. Or, or, or teachers or professors in college. I ain't talking about that. No, they ain't talking about that. Like, why are you still talking? They sleep. No, 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 not that. God put Abram to sleep and then made a covenant promise to him showing us the things that were written aforetime time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope, showing us that God doesn't keep his word to us because we know his word. He keeps his word to us because he knows his word. God is going to do what God said he's going to do because he heard him say it. The reason, I, 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 so I, I, teach, I teach people like how to have unshakable confidence, right? And I know I'm chasing rabbits right now, but this is a good rabbit and it needs, it needs, to, get, it needs to go. So I teach people how to have unshakable, unshakable confidence. And I tell people the reason you, like, the reason some people don't have confidence is because they don't have competence. But the other, another reason people don't have confidence is because they don't have character. What does that mean? That means the only person who's ever heard, the, the only person who's heard every lie that you've ever told is you. So when you tell somebody you're going to do something, you heard you say that. And then when you don't do it and you let yourself off the hook by using an, an excuse that you think matters, which doesn't matter, if you don't believe that excuses don't matter, you say, Myron, do you mean they don't matter that much? They don't matter at all. If you don't believe they don't matter at all, next time you get an electric bill from Tampa Electric, send them an excuse instead of a check and see if you're not living in the dark. In the real world, excuses don't matter at all. Nobody cares about why you didn't do what you said you were going to do. If you're not going to do it, just don't say you're going to do it. So what happens, so confidence, the word confidence, the root word of confidence is the word confide, Right? What does confide mean? It means to trust. So when a person doesn't have confidence, they don't trust themselves. Why? They don't trust themselves because they've broken their word to themselves so many times in the past, they can't believe a word they said. God cannot break his word to himself. I didn't say he won't. I said he can't. The scripture refers to God as a God who cannot lie, not as a God who does not lie. Why can't God lie? Because God's word is truth. What's the word for truth? Amet in Hebrew. Aleph mem tav. The letter Aleph represents God. The letter Mem represents the might of the ocean. What's more mighty than a tsunami, right? The might of the ocean. And then uh, Tav is a covenant or a cross. So the word for truth in Hebrew is God's mighty covenant. And by the way, if you take the Aleph, which represents God, from the word Amet, which is the word for truth in Hebrew, the word that's left is Met or, or Meth. And the word met means death in Hebrew. So if you separate God from the truth, like if God doesn't keep his word, God himself has to die. But if you separate God from the truth, all you have left is death. 
we wonder why perhaps one of the reasons there's so much murder in society is because we've attempted to remove God from our society. Maybe, do you realize when, this, when the Ten Commandments were hanging on the walls of public schools in the United States of America, there was never a school shooting? I want you to wrap your mind around that. There was never a school shooting when the Ten Commandments were hanging on the wall. One of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt not murder. But you remove God because he's not necessary. So you think, but even though the scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, we remove that, we remove God from the school and wonder why we have so much death. Hashtag just saying, maybe there's a correlation. <laughs> he said, I'm going to, he said, he said, don't you forget that I'm the one that gave you the power to get this wealth. The blessing of the Lord, riches are a blessing of the Lord because he's the one with the blessing you with the power to get the wealth. That's where the power came from. I, I am not rich because I'm a genius. I may or may not be a genius. That is yet to be determined, okay? <laughs> okay. I may or may not be a genius. I don't know. But what is for sure, I understand that everything good I have in my life is a gift. My ability to think is a gift. My ability to move is a gift. My ability to hear and to see. People say, like, some people ask me how I'm doing. I am utterly fantastic. Excellent as always. Well, surely, Byron, you're not always excellent. Surely I am. Now, just because you ain't always excellent, don't try to put your junk on me. Y'all ain't going to believe this. This is mind-blowing. Before I even got to my office this morning, I had so many gifts that I had already opened. Before I got to my office, I, I, I woke up this morning, I opened my eyes, and I could see. I know how to look but I don't know how to see. I can't make myself see. I said good morning to my wife. She said good morning back. Guess what happened? I could hear her. I know how to make myself listen. I don't know how to make myself hear. So seeing is a gift and hearing is a gift. I got up out of my bed and walked across the room and my legs would hold me. Now, not, my legs don't hold me as well as your legs hold you, but this is not a competition. So <laughs> let's, let's, let's just be okay. But I got up, hey, and my legs held me, and my hands would hold things. And I, I, I've got running water and air conditioning in my house. For those of you up north, this is Florida. <laughs> we still use air conditioner at night. Okay, okay. So I got air conditioner in my house. I have running water. I have electric lights. I go downstairs. I've got a car in the garage and three cars in the driveway, and I can pick any one of them I want to drive. And they have gas in them. Wow. And I don't even know how much the price of gas is. I have no idea. It could be, it might be $3 a gallon, it might be two, it might be seven. I don't know. I don't look. Why? I got to put the gas in there anyway. Either that or walk to work, and it's 12 miles from here. I wouldn't even be here yet. I've opened so many gifts. And then I come here to my office, and Larry and Marima are here my friends, my teammates, and then I come to do Bibles. All of y'all are here. Then y'all are watching on YouTube. Then y'all are watching on, like, I'm so blessed. Like, how could, I, how could I make the mistake of thinking I did any of this? How can, I, how can I go through the rest of my day with anything other than a heart of gratitude because of all the gifts I've already opened today? And yes, if my car breaks down on the way home and the doctor gives me bad news and, I lose, and the whole world goes kaput, I've opened so many gifts already, I don't even have time to give gratitude for all the gifts I've already opened. Anyway, so I didn't intend to go on that rant, <laughs> but I also didn't intend not to. Hashtag, just saying. Okay, the power, the power to get wealth. What is the power to get wealth? God gives us the power to comprehend wealth in our minds. That's a gift. Why does he do that? To establish his covenant that he made to our fathers. I, I know he said this to Israel. He said this to the children of Israel. But according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 29, we are the seed of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus. So you may or may not be of the physical seed of Abraham. But if you are in Christ, if you received him and trusted in his death and his burial and his resurrection as the full propitiation for your sin and not some religious deed that you've done, regardless of what that religious deed might be, 
then you are the seed of Abraham by faith in Christ Jesus, according to the scripture. So, like, so <laughs> the covenant that he made with Abraham applies to me. How cool is that? I wasn't even there when he put Abraham to sleep. He gave him this great dissertation. I wasn't there. But even though I wasn't there, I get to receive the blessing of that. And it's not just a blessing. It's a covenant blessing, which means he can't go back on it. But I better not forget where the power to get this wealth came from. Y'all track it. So, so he gives me, he gives me, he gives me the ability, the power, the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. He gives me the power to comprehend and conceive what I have to do to create wealth. He gives me that in my head. He gives it to you in your head too. Now, so the power to receive wealth is a gift. Where does it come? It comes in our, it comes in our head. It says, um, it says in Proverbs chapter 8, let's look at Proverbs chapter 8, verses 12 through 21. This is mind-blowing. Proverbs chapter 8. So <laughs> do you understand that like everybody who's ever created wealth was at one point just one idea away from that fortune? There was a time that Bill Gates was one idea from Microsoft. There was a time... Like Steve Jobs was one idea from one idea from Apple. There was a time when Sam Walton was one idea from Walmart. Jeff Bezos was one idea from uh, Amazon. Uh, Elon Musk was one idea from Tesla. Right now, you are one idea away. You're not 75 ideas away. You're one idea away. Okay. Deuteronomy, I mean, I said Deuteronomy. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, which is right after Proverbs chapter 7. Okay, and verse number 12. Here's what it says. This is so cool, y'all. So God gives the blessing of the Lord makes it rich. How does God bless you to get rich? He blesses you with the power to comprehend how to create wealth in your head. That's, one, that's part of the blessing to get rich, of the Lord to get rich, right? So here's what it says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse number 12. I wisdom. I who? I who? I wisdom. Don't act like y'all scared to talk, talk so they can hear you on YouTube. I who? I wisdom. I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out the knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Watch this now. This is wisdom. This is the personification of wisdom and understanding speaking. Here's what it says. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. So authority is the result, is a result of wisdom. How cool is that? Leadership is a result. By me, princes and nobles, even the, all the judges of the earth. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Watch this now. Here, look out. Verse 18. Riches and honor are with me. Yea, that means yes, durable riches and righteousness. Don't get it twisted. When you operate from the wisdom that is a gift of God, the blessing is not only can you have riches, because wisdom never travels alone. It brings durable riches and righteousness with it. You can be rich and righteous. It's in the Bible. Durable right, riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine gold. My revenue than choice silver. Why is the fruit of wisdom and understanding better than gold? Because the system can take your money, but they can't take your wisdom. They can take your, your assets, but they can't take your understanding. Knowledge is better than gold. Understanding is better than gold. Wisdom is better than gold. You can lose the money, but it's kind of hard to lose the knowledge. Right? Okay, let's keep it moving. I lead, huh, that's interesting. I lead in the way of righteousness, in the midst of the paths of judgment. Why? That I may cause those that love me. Who? wisdom and understanding, to inherit substance, and I will fill their treasure. <laughs> Did I put anything extra in there? The blessing of the Lord maketh the rich, because he gives us the wisdom, the power to create wealth. We, last week we talked about the purpose of wealth. This week we're talking about the power to get wealth. What's, what's the power to get wealth? He gives me the power to comprehend wealth in my head. Not only does he give me the power to comprehend wealth in my head. This is, by the way, this next one is where Satan messes with God's people. Yeah, this is where he got you all cattywampus. Say, Myron, what's cattywampus? That's a Texas word. It means out of kilter. 
Okay, y'all get <laughs> it, it, out of kilter is a Georgia word that means anyway. <laughs> okay, so 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 he put, this next one like Satan got Satan's got God's people broke as a joke and ready to choke because of this next one. And you say, Myron, what is that next one? Well, not only does he give us the power to get to comprehend wealth in our head, but he gives us the power to care about wealth in our hearts. I don't care about money. That's why you don't have any. Can you imagine being in a relationship with anything or anybody? Saying, Can you imagine me? I don't care about my wife. How long is she going to stay with that? I don't care about my husband. Who wants that? Nobody wants to be around or with somebody. Nobody's going to hang with somebody who don't care about them. I don't care nothing about my friends. You ain't going to have no friends. <laughs> God gives us the ability. And by the way, when somebody says they don't care about money, my first, I don't care about money. Every time I hear somebody say that, my immediate thought is this. If you will lie about that, you'll lie about other stuff. Because I haven't met a human being that has a job or owns a business that doesn't care about money. Because if you don't, why are you doing it? You ain't, you ain't doing it because you just, well, I just love to work. I, child, if you, they stop paying you, you wouldn't show up tomorrow. <laughs> now, let's, let, granted, none of us, none of us should care the most about the money. But all of us should care about the money. If you don't care about the money, maybe we should come get your family and take them to safety. Because they got to eat. And guess what you got to have? See, people say, Myron, Myron just, all he wants is your money. Okay, first of all, I don't even want your money. I have my own. I'm good, right? And my money has babies every day. <laughs> so <laughs> I got a whole bunch of money all up in the maternity war right now, giving birth <laughs> to some new dollars. Come on now. I am not confused, okay? <laughs> so, so uh, all the church wants to have, nobody ever says, all Walmart wants is our money. All Gucci wants is my money. All Michael Kors wants is my money. Nobody ever says that. All Amazon wants is my money. Nobody ever says that. Try to get something from one of those entities without some money. Okay, I'm just saying, just saying. So, so let's, let's, so here's what happens. Satan... <laughs> the God of lack, little g, God of lack. I, by the way, I did a video a couple weeks ago called Rich God, Poor God. Yeah, you might want to go check that one out. Satan, poor God, God of lack. Why? Because he owns nothing. He counterfeits everything because he owns nothing. He doesn't own anything. So he has to counterfeit everything. I, I, Frank Turk wrote a book um, called Stealing from God, Why Atheists Need God to Stake Their Case. Like Satan needs God in order to have do anything because he has to counterfeit everything that God did. He doesn't have an he's never had an original idea in his existence. Anyway, Satan through religion has gotten people to buy into this lie that somehow wealth is wickedness and poverty is piety. And so in religions, um, like like Catholicism, for instance, I'm not picking on Catholicism, but for instance, that's one. Like the people who are in that religious structure oftentimes take a vow of poverty because somehow me having less physical stuff makes me more spiritual. Well, I, the thing that makes you more spiritual is being more spiritually aware, okay? <laughs> and so um, Catholicism basically teaches either consciously or subconsciously that wealth is wickedness and poverty is piety. And and if you talk about, like, if you were to name a person in Catholicism who people think of as the most virtuous, one of the most virtuous people who ever lived, we're all thinking of the same person right now. Who are we thinking of? Mother Teresa, right? Right. Why? I mean, she was virtuous because she did all this great work, but she didn't have anything. Okay. I'm not saying she wasn't virtuous. I'm not saying that at all. That's not my implication at all. I, don't, I didn't even know her. I mean I, I mean, I know she did a lot of good things in the world. But I'll say this too, so while, I'm, while, I'm, while I'm upsetting apple carts, I might as well just turn them all over. <laughs> Entrepre entrepreneurship does far more good in the world than does charity. Entrepreneurship can exist without charity, but charity cannot exist without entrepreneurship. So while, while, I, was messing, while I was rearranging the furniture in people's head, I figured I might as well move that one out of the way. Okay. <laughs> 
I figured, anyway. Yeah, like, like, do you understand that our society could not operate without entrepreneurs? Could not. Could not. Nobody would, no, like all of the money you have in your pocket, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you do, the only reason you ever have any money, money in your pocket to do any things you desire to do for the people you love and the cause you care about is because somebody somewhere started a business and sold something for a profit, period. Okay. Well, no, I work for the government. The only reason the government has any money is because somebody somewhere started a business <laughs> and sold something for a profit and the government came and confiscated some of it and then gave it to you. Well, oh, am, am I confused? Or is, is there somebody in here who just loves paying taxes? I, I, right. Now, I, I do love the idea of taxes if it, were, if it were not in the hands of corrupt politicians. I like the idea of having a tax. In fact, in the Old Testament, the tithe was a tax because the children of Israel lived in a theocracy, and the tithe was a tax. And so that the, so that the priests and the Levites and the widows and the orphans would be taken care of. That was their inheritance. Like... <laughs> anyway, so, but it was a flat tax. It wasn't some variable sliding scale that you had to memorize a bunch of ridiculousness and millions of pages of documentation. Anyway, y'all, y'all picking up what I'm putting down. Okay, so, so gives us the, to care about the wealth. Look at, look at 1 Kings chapter 4. 1 Kings chapter 4, this is mind-blowing. By the way, this is the richest, the wisest, wealthiest man who ever lived. And I know some people are thinking, yeah, but, but Solomon, he wasn't, he, 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 he rebelled against the Lord. He did. Of course, you've never done that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> did I say that? Did I, did I say that out loud? Oops, oh. Yeah, he rebelled. Solomon, at the beginning of his life, was totally yielded to God. In the middle of his life, he was totally rebelling against God. At the end of his life, he came back and re-yielded his life to God. Go read Ecclesiastes. You'll see. Anyway, he found out the hard way that all the promises of the world are lies. The devil's pearls are paste pearls. They have no value. His, his diamonds are lustrous plastic, and his nectar turns out to be hog slop. And if you eat the devil's corn, he'll choke you on the cob every single solitary time. Okay, for First Kings chapter 4, <coughs> verse number 29. Um, I want to read more than verse 29. But I'm just, I'm just going to read verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much. What did he give him? Wisdom and understanding. We already talked about the power to conceive, the power to comprehend wealth in our head, right? He gave Solomon that power, but watch, watch what it says. And largeness, largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. He, had, he, gave, he gave Solomon largeness of heart, the capacity to care. The heart, when the Bible talks about lev, like lev, um, which is the word for heart in Hebrew, it's talking about the control center. Y'all have heard me teach before, human beings are singularly motivated. We do things for one reason, one reason only. What is that? Because we feel like it, right? So you're not going to create wealth until you feel like it, right? Right? You, gotta, you have to care about creating wealth. I care about creating wealth. Why do I care about creating wealth? Because I have a responsibility to my children and my children's children and my children's children's children. Huh. So I have a responsibility to my children's children, okay? I want you to think about this. So I've got my son, Anthony. I've got my daughter, Dee Dee. My daughter, Dee Dee, has a daughter, Ari. Ari is three. If I want to consider myself to be a good man, I want to look in the mirror and say, all right, bro, right before I die, bro, you did good. One of the things I have to do, I have to leave an inheritance to my children's children, which right now is Ari, who's three. So I've already calculated by the time, <laughs> this is so funny, by the time Ari is 18, no, by the time Ari is 21, let's say she gets married at 21 like my daughter did, okay? But 21's too young to get married. Okay, Mary, Mary and Joseph were probably 15 and 14, so quit tripping. So anyway, I figured I'd go ahead and mess up some more furniture in your head. <laughs> too young to get married. Okay, different story for a different day. My daughter was 21 she's been, when she got married. Okay, so Ari, if she gets married at 21, then by the time she turns 21, I'll be 79. 79. So, <coughs> the scripture says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. This is not just to your children now. 
this is to your children's children. Now, we know that you're supposed to leave an inheritance to your children. Go read Genesis chapter 24 when Eleazar is finding a bride for Isaac. And I, Abraham is still alive. And one of the things that Eleazar tells Rebekah's mother and her brothers is that my master, God's blessed him with great riches, and everything that my master has, he's already given to his son, but Abraham's still alive. This whole idea that we're supposed to wait until our children are dead to receive, I mean, until we're dead to our children to receive inheritance is not, and all these people who, and I know Warren Buffett says, I don't want to live, I don't want to, I don't want to leave all my money to my children just because they inherited the genetic lottery. I'd rather leave my ch money to my children who've been influenced by me and my wife than leave my money to some organization that's run by some chuckle-headed heathen who doesn't even have God's agenda in mind. Yes, I would rather do that. I'm not confused. If, I, if we amass $700 billion, I would rather leave it to my descendants than leave it to some charity that God knows who's going to run. Anyway. I ain't, I'm, anyway. You may disagree with me, but that's okay. We'll give you time to figure it out. Okay. <laughs> Y'all know I'm tripping when I say that. I'm just, I'm being funny, or at least attempting to. And if I'm not being funny, just pray for me. Don't judge me. Okay, so. <laughs> Larger than part. I'm going to tell you something. I care about creating wealth. Because when my, when my granddaughter gets married, I, me, Myron Golden, want to give her a house. When my son gets married, I want to give him a house. Why? Because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Now, let me ask you a question. Here's, here's what people say, though. Here's what the spiritualizers want to say. But that's not talking about houses and money and stuff. It's talking, about, it's talking about a godly heritage. That sounds really, really good for your religious thesis and your theories. But in reality, here's what the Bible says. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers. And a prudent wife is from the Lord. According to the scripture, one of the things I'm supposed to give my children is house and riches. Wow. It's in, it's in the Bible. But, I, but guess what? I taught my, my, my children and I were playing the cash flow game when they were in elementary school and junior high school. We were playing the cash flow game. And by the way, we didn't just play cash flow. We played cash flow for cash. The first person to get out of the right, first person to win get $25. Second person get $10. Third person get $5. My, I had three children. My oldest son, Adam, passed away from an accident, from injuries he secured, he uh, in, um, incurred in a car accident in 2007. But we used to pay our kids to play cash flow. Guess what? Now they play cash flow in real life. And they know how to move all the pieces and they totally could care less about the doodads. They're like doing the thing. They're like, they're like, do, like, I taught my children what to do with the money. I didn't give them money. I didn't give them money when they were children. I taught them how to be adults. Now as adults, I bless them with partnership. They're partners in my business. It's not my business, it's our family business. Anyway, God is not confused, y'all. We're confused. I can't believe I've been talking this long and I'm not even to the third point. I can, uh, I was, this is what I was saying. I care about creating wealth. Why do I care about creating wealth? I'm going to say something now. <laughs> I'm going to look in the camera so the YouTubes can see me. Y'all can see me, can't you? Okay, here it is. I care about creating wealth because I hate poverty. Myron, the Bible says love not, lo uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. For, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll give you that. It does say that. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. But in the meantime, in the meantime, and I, by the way, I don't even love money. I use money and love people, and I use money to love people. But I, I, I don't love money, but I'm going to tell you right now now, do not be confused. I hate poverty. I understand all of the devastation that poverty can bring. I grew up in it. It, it tried to crush me. I hate poverty. It's interesting. <laughs> One of the words, I'm going to go through the whiteboard. I didn't know I was going to do this. One of the words for wealth or for riches in the Bible is the word assure. So this is the word assure. It means wealth or riches, right? That's assure. Well, in Hebrew, 
because I, sh I showed you before, words are not just spelled, they're built. But oftentimes in the Bible, when you find a word that's written in Hebrew, if you write it backwards, it means the opposite. So this word means rich. If you write it backwards, it's the word rasha. Hmm. Rasha. Sometimes they leave out the sh and just it's ra, but rasha. What would you think rasha means? If rich mean if 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 the opposite the like rich is backwards, what is what would you think this would be? You'd think it'd be what? Poor, right? You'd think it'd be poor. But guess what? Rich backwards doesn't spell poor. Guess what it spells? It spells evil. What? I hate poverty. I hate it. Why? Because. By the way, that is not, the implication is not that rich, poor people are evil. That's not the implication at all. I don't even want to give anybody that mistaken impression. Here's the implication. People who habitually practice evil will be poor. How do you know that? Because the Bible says, the drunkard and the glutton shall lie down together and drowsiness will clothe the man with rags. It says, if you practice these evil behaviors, drunken, drunkenness, gluttony, and laziness, you'll be broke. Wow. The Bible talks about um, a, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord. So if you are not giving people what's rightfully theirs that they paid you for, guess what? That's evil. You're gonna end up broke. Societies that have abandoned God, evil societies, are historically and notoriously broke societies. Historities, like societies that practice evil are historically broke. Why? Because Satan is a God of lack. All he has to give you is fake promises that leave you with nothing. So therefore, you have lack. Okay, so I care about creating wealth. Like, like for me, creating wealth was not an option play. It was a basic bread and butter, mandatory play. This is what I am going to do. You say, Myron, were you obsessed with creating wealth? I was. I was obsessed with it until I created it. I'm no longer obsessed with creating wealth. Why? Because it's done. Now, I am obsessed with using the wealth that I've created to put more good into the world. Period. Now, you, don't, you say, I don't think you should be obsessed. Okay, then don't. You do what works for you. But here's what I found out. I'm, and that's not a, that's no, there's no judgment in that. I'm just saying, I'm saying people who accomplish anything noteworthy in life have a level of intention that looks like to people who are standing by an obsession. Real talk. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sidetrack because I could sidetrack on that whole thing and talk about how <laughs> people, people waste so much time. I just, I just, they waste so much time hyper-focusing on things that don't move the needle. Slavery is an interesting conundrum. One of the things that slave masters did to slaves in chattel slavery in the United States of America is they would give their slaves alcohol on the weekends and on holidays so they could forget that they were in slavery or not care as much. But watch this now. Here's what people do today. Here's what people do today. They anesthetize themselves with distractions so they don't have to feel the pain of the fact that their life isn't working. And that, anest that anesthesia doesn't always show up as alcohol and doesn't always show up as drugs. Sometimes it just shows up as a sports obsession. Here's the reality. People are obsessive. You're going to be obsessive over something. I might as well be obsessive over something that's going to do my family some good. I care about creating wealth. I'm not gonna, I don't have shoulds for other people, but I do have recommendations for other people. My recommendation is that you would do well to care about creating wealth for your family. Because the social, elitist, hyper-exaggerant, environmental people-haters are doing everything they can to create two classes again. 
the rich and the poor. And the rich are going to thrive and survive, and the poor are going to die. And they are doing everything in their power to obliterate what's known as middle class. Anyway. The scripture says clearly, thou shalt not pollute the land in which you dwell. Okay, I believe in that. Don't pollute the land in which you dwell. But this hyper obsession on an apocalypse that's created by an overpopulated planet to save the planet for whom and from what, I'm not exactly sure. And we'll kill as many people in the process as necessary is a level of evil and psychopathic and sociopathic control mongering the likes of which I've never seen. So, I know I used a lot of promulgated esoteric cogitations there, but I'll try not to do that anymore. <laughs> Shucks. Okay. All right. Now we got one more point, y'all. Here we go. Don't miss this one because this is the one where the, this is where the rubber hits the road. <laughs> and that is the power, the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich because God gives me not only the power to comprehend wealth in my head, not only the power to care about wealth in my heart, but the power to create wealth in my hands. Oh, by the way. One, one, let, me, let me just put it in reverse for a second. Care about wealth in my heart. One of the things that it says in the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 90, verse 12, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What does that mean? That means you only have a certain amount of time to get done the things you are going to get done. So be aware of the fact that you are dying so that you can live and not just exist while you are living. Okay. Okay. Um, we're blessed to create wealth with our hands. Ecclesiastes 5.19. I'm going to read two verses to you. Ecclesiastes 5.19. By the way, it's so essential and critically important to develop a skill. It says, every man also, this is Ecclesiastes 5.19, every man also, to whom God hath given riches and wealth, and hath given to him the power to eat thereof, and to take his portion, and to rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. Wow. Wow. I don't know if that's a wow to you, but that's a wow to me. That's a wow. Well, people say, that's all well and good, man. That's all in the Old Testament. And they say that as if the, it doesn't matter unless it's in the New Testament, which is so goofy. The Old Testament and the New Testament do not, um, they do not contradict each other. They complete each other. I made sure I muted out my mic before I did that. <laughs> so, there's a verse in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Here's what it says. And that you study to be quiet and to do your own business. What does that mean? Do your own business. Have your own enterprise. Do you understand that a job is not a biblical concept? The only people, go, go research it yourself. The only two classifications of jobs I can find in scripture are slaves and soldiers. Everybody else owned businesses. Go, and if you find one, please share it with me because that's all I've been able to find. I've not been looking that long, only 40 years, so maybe I missed it. <laughs> so, study, be quiet, and do your own business. Working with your hands, the power to create wealth, as we commanded you. Why? That you may walk honestly toward them that are without, and that ye may have lack of nothing. 
Guess what's God's plan for you to have lack of nothing? To have your own business, to work with your hands, so that you might have lack of nothing. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich. And he adds no sorrow with it. He blessed us with the purpose of wealth, which we studied last week. He blessed us with the power to get wealth, which we talked about this week. Seriously, though, go watch the video on why evil people are rich. It'll change your life. Stay blessed by the best. I'm out. Peace out, Cub Scouts.